I'm Austin, and I'd like to welcome you to Connection Church Online. Our purpose at Connection is to connect people to Jesus and one another. Our Sunday worship service is a great opportunity for us to turn our focus to Jesus and connect with Him. In a few minutes, we'll hear a message from God's Word to lead our hearts to Christ. If you're watching this live online, interact with others by commenting when something stands out to you. Take notes of what you hear today and make plans to apply God's word to your life. Our sermon series is called Living Out My Purpose. As a church, we're going to learn how to take God's purposes for our lives and put them into practice to live them out. I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for continuing to give during this difficult time. You know, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God more than anything else. But what he taught about second most was our relationship with money. Money is a gift from God, but if it becomes the priority of our lives, it can be an idol that promises way more than it can deliver. However, with gratitude to God and by faith, the offerings that we give to the church are actually an act of worshiping God. We express thankfulness to him for providing here and now, and we show our faith that he will continue providing in the future. As you consider your offerings today, do so with an attitude of worship and give as the Lord leads you. I'm happy you're here, and I pray the Lord speaks powerfully to you during our worship service. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment from God? He answered this question in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This is the heart of our purpose at Connection Church when we say our purpose is connecting people to Jesus and one another. Now let's prepare our hearts to listen to the Word of God and to enjoy today's message from Pastor Daniel. Hey, Connection Church. Thank you, Austin, for that introduction. And while we have been missing being together in person, we have also been missing another element of worship, and that is singing. And so today we have a special treat. We're going to have Angela and Gabriel lead us in some music today. So uh, they're going to sing a song for us right now. I want to encourage you to, to listen to it, to worship, uh, allow the the Word of God to be sung over you. Uh, also, feel free, of course, to sing along with them if you feel like doing that as well. So let me pray for us, and let's get into it. Uh, the song we're singing is Nothing is Impossible, and I know for me, I need this promise in my life because there is a lot going on, and it is um, easy to think that healing is impossible. But we're going to see from Scripture today that all things are possible in Christ. So, let me pray for us, and then we're going to worship the Lord together in song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we have the joy of being known by you today. We have the joy of redemption. We have the joy of being forgiven. We have the joy of grace. We have the joy of mercy. We have the joy of being made new. Thank you so much for the good news of your gospel. Thank you that we have an opportunity to worship the one true God. So Lord, I pray that as this song is sung and as we worship you in this way, I pray that our hearts will be drawn to you by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the word of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Strongholds are broken. 
I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Yeah, yeah. Nothing is impossible. I'm not going to live by what I see. I know that you're here with me And I know that you can do anything Through you, through you, I can do anything I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible through you Blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken Amen. That's good. That's powerful. I love that song. And thank you so much, Angela and Gabriel, for, for leading us in that this week. And look forward to having actually another song today at the conclusion of the sermon. We're going to have an opportunity to, to hear a song that's going to lead us to respond to the Lord and the message that He has for us today. And I'm excited to share with you the message today because it is timely. Right now we're living in a world that is broken in so many different ways. And um, I just saw on the news today that there's this Sahara dust, dust from the, the desert that's heading over to the United States and uh, is going to be affecting us too. And so it just seems like things keep piling on uh, in this world we live in. And uh, one of the things we were talking about uh, Tuesday night during prayer, Brian and I were, were talking and uh, one of the things I've been reading that day was how the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts was, was like getting beaten and uh, there were beatings happened where judges were dragged out and uh, people were dragged out and beaten. It was just a really rough world that he lived in and yet he still said in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 or 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so, that's 4 6 of Philippians. And uh, so, so, Paul lived the gospel in a very tumultuous time. So, more than ever, we really need the power of the gospel in our lives. And we need to be reminded that it's not some cookie-cutter thing that we're supposed to follow. It's not the key to having an easy life, but it's the key, it is the key to having victory in an easy life or a comfortable life when we have those uh, seasons in life, certainly the key to living a victorious life in these tumultuous times that we're in. And so today I want to talk about cleaning house and, and what does it look like when Jesus cleans house? When Jesus cleans the house, and I'm not talking about just, you know, dusting, you know, today, you know, or actually today I'm recording this before Sunday, but, you know, Carrie was cleaning the house and vacuuming and then you just see all the dust that gets into the vacuum and, and, and the dirt and, and so, um, I'm not talking about that kind of cleaning. What I'm talking about is when there's this corruption that is uh, prevalent. And when Jesus comes in and He makes things right. Isn't that what we're wanting right now? Isn't that the, the world we're living in where we're tired of seeing people killed by policemen when they're supposed to be the ones protecting us? Isn't that what we yearn for when we see and think about voting in November uh, for, for people that are going to be representing us? Don't we want people with integrity? Don't, don't we want to see our leaders 
uh, in church and our leaders in every other aspect of life. And don't we really want that for ourselves? Don't we really want to have a clean house within us as well? And so I want to talk today because a couple things are happening. There's a lot of movement in our world today. A lot of people are, are, have causes and they're uh, specifically uh, applying their energies toward those causes. And a lot of it is really good. But some of it is incomplete. And here's what I mean by that. If you're just going in to tear something down and you don't have an answer for healing that thing or, or replacing it with what is good, is that really any better? It, it typically just shifts who's in charge or who the power is. And so what I want to talk about today is what happens when Jesus cleans house? What happens when he arrives on the scene? Because there is a specific act of Jesus that we see in the scriptures that gets quoted so much right now. I hear it all the time, and it's talking about when Jesus went in and he flipped the tables in the temple. He went into his father's house at the temple. And so I'm going to show you because this event is in all four of the Gospels. Uh, the Gospels are, and when we talk about that in the scripture, are the first four books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the shortest one. It's also the oldest one. Uh, they put them in different order. We'll talk about that some other time. But Mark is the first and the oldest, and it is the shortest as well. So I'm going to start actually with Mark's account. And I want you to see how each of the Gospels talk about this event. And let's see where we end up. All right? So if you want to get your notes, you can uh, write these things down. And let's talk about what Jesus did when he cleaned house. Are you ready? Here we go. So in Mark chapter 11, verse 15 is where this gets started. And it says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple. Now, just to kind of set the stage on what happened here, Jesus was, this was like Holy Week for him. This was when he went into Jerusalem and um, he was heading to cru the crucifixion later in this week. And so this is one of the things that he does. It says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. And he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it, Is it not written that my house, and he's speaking of uh, the scripture in the Old Testament where God says, my house. And so he's, my house means God's house. Is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? Now, this is really cool. All nations. Not just the Jewish nation, but for all nations. But you have made it a den of what? A den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, and they began looking for a way to kill him. They were so angry because they feared him. And why did they fear him? Because the whole crowd was amazed at Jesus' teaching. Now that's Mark's account, and he moves on from there. But here's what happened. Jesus went into the temple courts, and he's like, this ain't right, and this ain't right. I'm going to fix this. And he was angry, and he flipped over the tables and stopped the... Um, the oppression and the injustice of the money changers taking advantage of those people who were coming to worship God. The temple had to use their own kind of money, so people would come in and they give money to them, and they would change it back to them, and they would always overcharge them. Have you, if you've ever gone to a different country, you have the money change rate, and depending on what country you go to, you know, like I went to China a few years back, and uh, their currency is like one, a second, I get six of their currency for every one of my dollar when I went. And it's probably about the same now. And so, uh, and plus things cost less over there too. So if you took, you know, a hundred American dollars, it was like 600 uh, yuan, I think is what that's called, you know, their currency. Then, and, and typically it would go a long way because it was worth more. And so what the money changers were doing is they were manipulating the currency to where they would get to keep more of the money that was coming in and give, giving people back less. And so they were taking advantage of that. And Jesus said, this is not right. My father's house is a house of prayer for all nations. 
you're taking advantage of them. So Jesus came in and he cleaned house. Now I see this verse quoted, this not verse because it's more than one verse, but I see this incident or this um, historical truth event of what Jesus did at this temple. And I see that now with people that are that are making moves and they're saying, Jesus went in and he, he tore it up and he cleaned house and that's what we're going to do. We're going to make changes. And um, yeah, I'm, it was quite a few years back, but I actually had someone tell me there was this spirit that they had or, or this desire that they had. And, and almost verbatim, pretty much word for word, they said, you know, I just want to be arrested one day for standing up for something I believe in. And I was like, okay. I didn't really know how to respond to that, so I just kind of changed the subject and moved on in a different direction. Um, and so if you ever you know, are talking to me and I just change the subject, eh, maybe I don't know how to respond to what you're saying. And so what, but what I would respond now is, is I would say, don't you think that's kind of selfish? To just want to do something so that you can be arrested, so that you can say you did something? It's short-sighted, and, and so many times we can take a scripture that God has for us in, the, in, in His Word that is pure and holy and good, and we can turn that to something to say, I want to do something, I want to be like Jesus, I want to stand for something, and I want to do this. But it stops and it falls short of what we are to do as Christians. So, what I want us to do now is we're going to look at all four of these gospel accounts, alright? So let's look at Luke next, and let's see if we can get a little more information about what happened at this event. So this is in Luke. Luke is great. He took great notes. It's the longest of the Gospels, has a lot of content. He also wrote the book of Acts and recorded that for us. So Luke is great. Here we go. And Mark is great too. Uh, Mark, you did a good job too. Here we go. When Jesus entered the temple, the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day Jesus was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. So Jesus was there teaching in the temple. Yet they could not find any way to do it because, why? All the people hung on his words. They loved it. And so the chief priests were afraid to go after Jesus. Why? Because if they did, the mob of people would protect him. They were afraid of the people. They were very much trying to steer the, the, the crowds of people to think another way, which is why you're going to see later on in the week uh, of the Holy Week for Jesus uh, where they're having these courts and they're having them after hours, uh, and, and they're doing all kinds of things to manipulate, manipulate the crowd. They lacked the spine, to, uh, the courage and the spine, the backbone to do what was right because they feared the people. Now, Jesus didn't fear the people. Jesus did what was best for the people. So that's one thing we can think about and praise God for when it comes time to clean house, that Jesus was not afraid of what people thought. Jesus was pursuing truth. And Jesus was pursuing justice because he knew that he was going to have to go to the cross and deliver the ultimate justice for you and for me and for every living person. This is Luke. Jesus flipped the tables. You've made it a den of robbers. No more. So let's see what John says. And the reason I'm doing this is because um, one of the things that I've seen, uh, this is a little insight into my, my heart right now. Um, one of the things I've been learning and, and hearing is that uh, as a white man, it is important for me when it comes to racial tensions and, 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 and understanding racism and understanding how our black brothers and sisters are, are living in a world quite different from what my world is. What I have learned is that it's on me to dive into that. It's not on them to explain everything to me. So I don't need to be you know, dependent on my black brothers and sisters to tell me every little thing so, uh, and to coddle me. What I need to do is the hard work of seeking this out for myself. If I really care, if it's really personal to me, then I need to do the hard work to seek this out myself. And so what I want to do is, is challenge you, uh, like I've been challenged, challenged in this regard, is for you as a Christian to do the same thing. It's not on me 
to coddle you for everything. And I'm not saying that you're doing that, but I want to challenge you and I want to say it's on you to seek out the Scriptures. It's on you when people quote Jesus, you need to find out, are they quoting Him correctly? Is that really what He said? And then go into the Scriptures and find that out. And let's have you know, conversations about it and discuss it. And of course, you know, I've talked with Angela and Brian extensively uh, a lot about the, the current events of our day and how, um, how I can respond to it and just how to understand the world, different perspectives. So it doesn't mean that I don't talk to my black friends and brothers and sisters, not just friends, but family, right? And, and I don't just talk to them or I don't not talk to them. I want to keep this in because I'm stumbling over words, and that's a real, real me. That's the real me. It's not that I don't talk to them, but it's that I do my homework on the front end and I seek things out. Does that make sense? You nod with me. There we go. It makes sense. And so, for the same thing as Christians, it's for on us to do the hard work as well. For us to find out what it is. If we say we follow Jesus, if we say that we're His follower, do we really care what He says? If we say that He's He's our King. Do we live as though He is our King? Or do we just kind of add Him to our life when it's convenient? Big difference. So in John, let's look at John. John's a little different in his gospel because this happens in John chapter 2. And so John chapter 2, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And so like think synonym. Synonym means something is similar. And so they're progressively in order. They line up... um, What's the word? <laughs> they they line up as a what's it called when it goes in order of time? They line up. Uh, you know, not, oh goodness, I'm gonna keep this in here too. But they line up as far as time goes, as the progression of time. They line up that way. John kind of kind of jumps around. So in John chapter two, he's talking about like Holy Week, and so he goes back and forth over time. It's not um, whatever that word is I'm looking for that we'll find later. Uh, it doesn't go in. Uh, sequential order. I don't know. Let's, let's say that. So John is in John chapter 2, but it's the same event, and he records it this way. Here's what it says. It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their table. So it even gives us a little more detail of extra animals here and also scattering the coins on and, and flipping the tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. He's cleaning house, right? Stop turning my father's house into a market. Stop it. Knock it off. So he's cleaning the house. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And I think this is Psalm 69, I think. I don't have it in front of me right now. But he's quoting uh, a psalm here that is speaking of, um, of Jesus. And the Jews then responded to him, to, to Jesus, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Like, who do you think you are? Show us a sign if you think you have this authority. And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, the temple he was in had took a long time to build, okay? And so they were thinking that he was talking about the temple, and of course, like we often do, they didn't understand what he was saying. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to do it in three days? Who do you think you are? But the temple Jesus had spoken of was his body. It wasn't the temple that they were thinking of. There was a new temple that was coming. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So the disciples had heard him say this too. And after the resurrection, they started having these epiphanies, these moments of like, oh, that's what he meant. Oh, that's what he meant. Now you've had those in your life too, haven't you? Where you've heard something and then down the road something happens and it just clicks with you like oh that makes so much sense now i never really understood and so the same thing happened for the disciples and they remembered what jesus had said like oh he was talking about his body he wasn't talking about the temple itself so jesus was cleaning house if we just look at these three instances we're going to miss something very important 
Very important. So let's just look here. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector. Here we go. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling. Okay, yada, yada, yada. Now, sometimes we do this. Okay, sometimes I've done this before with Scripture where we think, oh, yeah, I've heard this story before. And we can just start to, yeah, this is in the other ones. And we read through it faster because we think we know it. That's a mistake. Absorb it. Realize that every one of these has something about it that is good. And so it's our job to do the hard work to figure that out. Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. It sounds just the same as all the other ones, right? It sounds just the same. Jesus goes in, he cleans house, he gets them out of there like, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. Boom, you're out. Boom, you're out. And he just cleans house. But there's another detail that we're going to see here in this very next verse that shows us the heart of God. Look at this. It says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. The blind and the lame came to Jesus at the temple and he healed them. So, is Jesus a God of justice? Yes, a hundred percent. But Jesus' justice, the God's, God's justice, doesn't stop with just going in and wrecking things. It brings healing. Amen? God brings healing to the oppressed. And check this out. He even brings healing to the oppressor. God's justice goes to all those who are blinded by being the oppressor and those who are suffering by being the oppressed. He brings healing to them. And so the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and Jesus healed them. We see the heart of Jesus in this. And so we need to be careful as Christians, as followers of him, not to just have this agenda to go and tear things down and to just say, we have to just tear it down because it doesn't work. What we need to do is be totally committed to the entirety of God's Word. That yes, there is a time for us to go in and say, no more, this has to change. But at the same time, it is our job to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to also administer healing and it's not just those who are, who are blind and lame who need to be healed. It's also the ones who are blinded by greed, who are blinded by the, the lust for the things of the world, that they want more and more to the point where they oppress other people. So many people are, um, are caught up in that and they don't even understand it. In some ways, you and I can be caught up in things in life. We can be caught up in sins that are hiding in the depths of our heart. And what we need to do is have God fix those blind spots in our heart and our eyes, you know, but our heart, our desire. And also to the, the lame came to him, those who couldn't walk. And so we need to remember that without Christ, we are powerless, that we are not able to walk on our own or to understand or to live with power. And so we are the ones who have been healed by Jesus as well. So many times we just respond to anger with anger. And I know I've done it. And I'm not... I don't want to. But sometimes I fail. And I need to remember that if I'm not bringing compassion and healing to the situation, then all I'm doing is I'm not cleaning house. I'm going in. I'm just making a mess of it. We talked about a few weeks ago how hurt people hurt people. And we also and also said, but healed people heal people. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to find our healing in Christ. We need to be made need, we need to be made whole and to be made right with God so that we can be right with each other. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things Jesus did, this is what the world needs right now. 
They need to see the wonderful things of Jesus. They need to see the church step up in a way that is simultaneously cleaning house by turning the tables over and and finding a freedom for those who are oppressed and those who need our help. We need to be the the voices of change, but we also need to be the embodiment of the healing that flows through Christ, from Christ, through us into the world. The chief priest. And the teachers of the law, they saw the wonderful things. They witnessed what happened. And they also did this. They also heard the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save us. When we sing that song, Hosanna, it means save us, son of David. And and, and they were indignant. Not the children, but the chief priests were indignant. They were angry because Jesus was doing these wonderful things. He was getting the crowd on his side too, and that's all they were worried about was the power, okay? And now Jesus was allowing them to call him God, the Son of David, the Messiah, and they were angry, beyond angry. They were livid. They were indignant. And Jesus said this, Do you hear what these children are saying? And of course, he knew the answer. He says, do you hear what these children are saying? Oh, excuse me. Sorry, it wasn't Jesus. My bad. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? And yes, replied Jesus. He says, have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. Have you never heard that, that, that the children are going to be the ones that do that? And so... He was saying, yeah, I hear the children. Don't you know that the children are the ones who are going to to praise the Lord? He was calling himself Lord in front of them. And he left them and he went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. Now, what happened here? Jesus came in on the scene. He cleaned house, but he also was cleaning hearts. He He was healing people. He was showing them that there is a better way than this. I'm not just coming here and making another mess and handing it over to another oppressor. What I am doing is I'm actually bringing freedom to the captive. I'm actually bringing liberty. I'm actually bringing um, deliverance. And I'm going to bring healing to you. And what he did was he went on to Bethany and he continued about his journey to the cross. And that's what he knew he had to do. And so the question I have for you is, Has Jesus cleaned the temple of your heart? I really want you and me to spend time on this. To really just dive into the depths of our heart and say, Do I want peace with my enemies? Because right now, this is a fractured nation in a world, and it is really difficult to know who we can trust. But I know who we can trust, and you know who we can trust, and His name is Jesus. And what we need to do is we need to be putting ourselves to the Lord. Just like the blind and the lame came to Jesus, we need to be continually coming to Him and say, Jesus, change me, change me, change me, clean my heart. Make me right. Remove racism from my heart. Remove prejudice from my heart. Remove greed and lust and anger and all these things um, that are in my heart. And pride, Lord, just get pride far from me. Remind me who I am without you. But also, Lord, as you do that, remind me of who I am in you. That yes, without you, I am nothing. But with you, all things are possible. And because of you, I am a new man or a new woman. I am a new person. And Jesus, you have cleaned my heart. And so if we allow Jesus to clean our heart, then when we go and we flip over tables, we will be ready to minister to those to those who need healing. And we won't be going in and just making a bigger mess and hoping that somehow it will make a difference. We don't have to hope in our actions making a difference. If our hope is in Jesus, we know that our actions will make a difference because the love of Christ will be manifest. It will come alive through us. The way we love one another is going to bring glory to God. 
The way we minister to one another brings glory to God. The way we serve our community brings glory to God. The way we voice for justice brings glory to God. And the way we administer healing, healing, have an answer, brings glory to God. Now, it also brings along criticism as well because the chief priest didn't like this. And so anytime we stand for what is right, we are going to be subject to criticism and potentially even persecution. But it's worth it. Jesus gives us this mandate to go and to live as He did, to, to go and to, to serve and to give our lives the way He gave His life. And the only way that can happen, the only way we can really represent Jesus is if our heart is truly changed. And this isn't, just I'll, I'll close with this, this isn't a one-time thing. You don't like, oh, my heart's changed. I'm, I'm good from this point on. No, this is like a continual relationship with God type change. That God, you're always working to always make me more and more like Christ. It's a refinement. You're going to go through trials and temptations and all those things that we talked about in the 40 Days of Purpose, right? All those things make you conform more and more to the image of Christ. So this isn't something that you've already figured out, I promise. You've got work to do, and it's on you to do it, but you're going to get there. If you are willing to say, Lord, change me, make me a better person, get the log out of my eye before I start looking out there at the problems of the world, change me, then we are ready to go to be used by God for great things. Amen? So what I'm going to do now is pray for us. And we're going to have another song uh, with Angela and Gabriel. And I want you to spend this time as this song is sung to really just uh, bow your head, close your eyes, and allow the, the message of this song to just minister to your heart. And may that truly be your, um, your prayer of change me, Lord. Change me. That's actually the name of the song that we're going to be singing. So let me pray for us and let's prepare our hearts to respond to the Lord. Father, thank you so much that you are a God of justice. That you, that is who you are. You desire for all nations to come to you. You desire for us to to pray to you, to to take care of one another, and for there to be harmony among your people and in the world as a whole. Thank you for that. Thank you for being a God of justice that that took on the burdens of the world, that took on the sins of the world, that took on my sin and and and. and administer true justice, Lord, when you who were innocent died a sinner's death. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And Lord, I pray right now that you would continue to change my heart, continue to change each person's heart who is listening and watching this message, Lord. May we not be guilty of going out and trying to change the world so that we can feel good about what we've done. But Lord, may we... May we be just filled with the joy of knowing that what you have done for us is enough. It is enough and it causes us to be able to stand and be your voice here in this broken world that desperately needs to be healed. Thank you, Jesus, for doing everything the right way. Thank you for being someone that we can truly follow. And thank you for changing our hearts. We love you, Lord. And as we sing this song, we ask that you would continue your work in us. We give ourselves to you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Change me, O oh God. Make me more
make me more like you. Change me, oh God. Wash me through and through. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart. So Amen. Thank you so much, Angela and Gabriel. And for, the, for everyone else, I want to just leave you with this blessing. It's the same blessing that we give every week here at Connection Church. And here it is. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may His peace guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.